Praise the Lord. <laughs> How many of you have your Bibles? Have you got your Bibles? Okay, good. Glad to see that. I really am. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're in the midst of this exciting portion of Scripture where we are uh, learning what it means to grow in the Lord. We know what it means to be blessed by the Lord, to have the indwelling Spirit of God, and to, uh, to know that our names are written in heaven, and that God has a plan for the church, for his people. We know our inheritance, all of those things. Um, but And that's the first half of Ephesians, what God has done internally. But now Paul t is turning his attention by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is really writing this. He turns his attention to the outward, the actions. It's one thing to say, I have the Spirit of God within me, but then it's another thing for it to show forth. And we're not going to give up on either one of those. It starts on the inside, but it does need to come out on the outside. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. That's, that's the whole point. Otherwise, he could have stopped at the end of chapter 3 and said, hallelujah, amen, and closed the book. But there's some work to be done always within the church. Most of the New Testament is, is corrective when you get into the uh, uh, Romans and on through the epistles, the letters. Most of them are corrective in nature to one form or another. They have exhortations that are encouraging to us. But it seems like there's always work to be done. And that's why we're beginning in Ephesians chapter 4 uh, today. And we will be looking, we'll start back at verse 17. And uh, we will read through verse 24 and we'll focus on a particular portion of this section. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And what is it that we've been taught? That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And today, taking verses 20 and 21 as our topic, but you have not so learned Christ, I want to bring a message to you in the school of Christ. In the school of Christ. We've come to school today, whether you knew it or not. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I ask that you would minister by your spirit, that you would accomplish what only you can accomplish. And Lord, as you speak to our hearts, as you speak to our minds, as we uh, grow in regards to, you, to your word, I pray it would not only be intellectual so-called, but that it would also then have impact on our hearts. We do need to understand it in our minds, and our minds need to be renewed. But I pray today that what we hear, what we learn, that it would be put into practice in our lives. Lord, uh, above all else, we want to learn correctly and then we want to live correctly. So I pray we would put these things into practice in our hearts and in our lives. And I pray that would be the case so that when we walk out, we'll be more like Jesus than when we came in. We want to be your people. We want to be living letters that are read of all people, even the unsaved, that point them to Jesus. So move by your spirit in our lives today. In Jesus' name, we ask these things, and everyone said, amen. amen and amen. So we learn from this passage um, a lesson that may bring uh, joy to you or it may bring despair to you. And the lesson is, is that for believers, for Christians, we are always in school. You came to school today. Now, maybe you didn't like school. And maybe you say, boy, I was so glad when I walked that graduation line or got my GED or however you got through, you say, wow, I'm glad that part of my life is behind me. Well, very good. I'm glad for you as it relates to those things. 
But as it relates to Jesus Christ and to our relationship with him, we are told in no uncertain terms here in verses 20 and 21 that we continue to learn Christ. We continue to hear him. We continue to be taught of him. And that, my friends, is a lifelong journey. No one will graduate from the school of Christ while they are still here on this earth. The graduation will come when we pass into glory. Can I get an amen on that? That is the absolute truth. And so we are always in school. We cannot play hooky from school if we're going to use this analogy. How many have, well, don't raise your hand, but if you played hooky, you know what that means. Skipping school, skipping class. When it comes to Christianity... Just as it would be in the case of skipping school and, and failing classes and then not graduating, let me tell you something, the stakes are even higher when it comes to being in the school of Christ. Listen to me. We can fail out. We can flunk out. We must continue to learn. You may start school in first grade, but that does not mean you will finish school up in 12th grade or whatever it need be in your case. Starting good is great, but then we must continue to learn. And it is not enough as well. Not only must we not play hooky, but we can't afford to stay in the first grade the whole time. There are a lot of Christians that they just want to stay in the first grade. They just want to stay with just give me just the milk and cookies. I had a professor who was also a, a pastor in a church for many years before he came to the Bible college that I attended. And he, he used to have a hang up when people would say, we share the gospel. And follow me on this. He said his thing would always be, listen, you don't share the gospel. You share milk and cookies. You preach the gospel. You proclaim the gospel. You don't just share it like you do milk and cookies. And I would say to you that we have to continue to learn and grow in the Lord. We can't stay in first grade or second grade. We should always be progressing in our Christian life. Why? Because literally our eternal life is at stake. Oh, but I'm already saved. But you didn't get your diploma for high school when you started first grade, did you? Can I just quickly remind you that there are different tenses where salvation is used in the Bible. And, and by that, I mean there is a past tense. We have been saved. The Bible talks about that. There is a present tense in many verses in the New Testament. We are being saved. We can read that in many verses. And then there's a future tense. We shall one day be saved. Well, what does that mean, Pastor? I'm schizophrenic. No, you, don't need, you need not be schizophrenic. It means that we have been saved. God has done a work in our heart and in our life. But as we grow in him, we are being saved, being sanctified, growing in our knowledge of him. And we are still here on this earth and we are still walking this earth. And we are in that place, if you would, of probation where we are growing in him. We have no fear of losing our salvation. If we are believers, we continue to grow in him. But then there is also a future aspect of salvation. We shall be saved. And in order for the we shall be saved to take part, I must now keep being saved as in I'm just walking the road with Jesus. I'm learning. I'm staying in school. I'm keeping, I'm keeping my heart right from him. I'm not being a truant. I'm not running away from school. I'm not saying no to Jesus. Oh, I've got my diploma, but we really don't have our diploma until we get to heaven. So we continue to learn of him, and this is what Paul tells the Ephesians. And he says this on the heels of just giving this description that we talked about last week in verses 17 through 19 of the Gentile way of life. Remember, we said that for us to really get the full brunt of this, instead of saying, no longer walk as the Gentiles walk, what did I say that we need to do? No longer walk, where are we at? What, what, what nation do we live in? America. You guys were taking notes last week. Wow. <laughs> so it, to get the full brunt of it, we should say, no longer walk as the Americans walk. And that's not a, a slam. I love my country. I would say the same thing if we were in South Africa or any other place on the face of the earth, to make it personal, we would say, okay, no longer walk as all the other Floridians walk, as they live, as they live their life, we have to live our life in a different way. And so on the heels of all that, now the Apostle Paul says, you didn't learn Christ that way. In other words, you've not been taught 
that the way that you follow Jesus is to live just like the world any longer. To the contrary, we're going to see something has to change. And so the question I'm going to ask us several times throughout the message today is just the simplest question if we're going to use this analogy of being in the school of Christ. So I'll ask it for the first time right now. Are you still in school? Are you still in school? Only you can really answer that. So let's, let's look at verses 20 and 21. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. And we'll break this down. So the first thing Paul says is, but you have not so learned Christ. Paul immediately is going to tell these believers in Ephesus that the antidote to a life of partying that they just got through reading about in those earlier verses, because the Gentile world is a world filled with partying. It's a, it, it, the whole mindset is pleasure. Let me do what I want to do. Let me live my life. Paul says the antidote to that type of life, to that type of excess in life, is to reject the lies, the old lies of the old life. We turn aside from that and say, you know, all that was a lie. The whole thing of telling me to live for today and live for myself and do what I want to do. Because, oh, you only go around once. And so live for today. All that is actually a lie from Satan. Amen. All of that is designed to keep us in an old form, an old way of life. And Paul says the antidote to those old lies of this world's ways is to embrace the eternal truths of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we have to learn Jesus Christ. Did you know that the concept of learning is very prevalent in the Bible? Give you a few examples. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13. Jesus says, but go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So Jesus tells the Pharisees and, the, and, and those that think they're all right with God. He says, you need to go and learn what this Old Testament verse means. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Jesus says to his disciples, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Learn of me, Jesus says. John 6, 45, it's written in the prophets. They shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father, Jesus said, comes to me. If you have learned from the Father, you come to me, Jesus says. Romans 16, 17. Now I urge you, brethren, to keep an eye on those that cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you have learned and turn away from them. So there's an expectation of learning in the church and of knowing things that are right and wrong and even knowing teaching that is right and then being able to have an antenna, a radar that goes up when someone brings a teaching that's wrong, that causes dissension, that causes all kinds of separation in the church, then boom, radar goes up because we've learned. How about Philippians 4, 9? The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul says, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. He says, have you learned? 2 Timothy 3, 14. You, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And then one more, in Titus 3, 14. Our people must also learn, and this our people means God's people, the church. Our people must learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. So sometimes we have to learn what it means to engage in good deeds. Oftentimes in the church, one of the things that we always have to keep a balance on is this thing of, I don't want to hear about good deeds because that means I'm working for my salvation. And so I'm going to, as far away from good works as I can get, I'm just all faith. So I'm rowing that oar of faith. I'm rowing it, rowing it, rowing it. Do you know what happens when you row one oar when you're in a boat and you only row one oar? <laughs> it's going around in a circle. So some people are so concerned because they know I'm not saved by my good works. So therefore, I'm not going to talk about good works. I'm not going to think about good works. I'm not going to engage in good works sometimes. 
They just row in the oar of faith and they're just going around in a circle. Of course, the same would be true of people that think nothing of faith and only base their salvation on their good works. They're rowing around in a circle as well the other way. What we need to do is actually embrace both of these concepts, knowing that it begins internally with our relationship with God. We learn of God, but Paul actually says that our people must learn to engage in good deeds. When there's a pressing need, engage in good deeds so that they will not be unfruitful. So the Lord wants us to bear fruit. Amen? Amen. Remember Jesus, he compared himself to the, the, the trunk of the tree, the vine. He says, I'm the vine and you're the branches in John 15. And basically what he says is, as long as you're attached to me, the life comes from me. If you're attached to me, you'll be fruitful. You'll have fruit. If you cease to bear fruit... The big problem may be that you're not attached to me or you've become so dead that then you have to be sawed off. Now, the good thing is, is that Paul says in Romans, sometimes those that fall away because of their lack of faith, they begin to not believe. If they believe again, Paul says they can be grafted back in to the tree. So God's a, a God of mercy and love. He gives us many, many chances, amen? But the key is that we continue to learn of him. So again, I ask myself, or I ask you the question and ask myself, are you still in school? We got to keep asking that. So he says, you have not learned, but he says, you have not so learned Christ. And the concept of that is you have not learned Christ in this way. And so what does that mean? And in what way? This refers back to the old way that the Gentiles live their lives. Again, Paul is saying, this is not how you learned to live the Christian life. Can I just, let me just throw up the, the flag here and, and remind us of something. The world does not expect us to live like them, talk like them, look like them, act like them, have the same values of them in order to persuade them. This is one of the big lies that the devil has perpetrated upon the church for many, many decades now. We were way, many in the church were way over before on this thing of legalism. And oh, we're never going to talk to anybody on the outside and we just bought to ourselves and we're so holy and we're this and we're that. And the church was often way over here. Make sure you got your dress length, to, you know, all the way down to the floor, ladies, and make sure men that you're wearing long sleeve shirts and da, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Church was way over there. But then Satan is so good at wanting to get us rocking. He likes to rock us. Some of these really skilled basketball players, they get on the court and somebody's defending them and they just taking that ball from side to side. And the, the, the coach is saying, don't let him rock you to sleep. Don't let him rock you to sleep because you just, you're getting hypnotized. You're going one side to the other to the other. Satan is very good with this. So we had this thing of too much legalism and now we've swung the pendulum all the way over here where now all we have is license. Now the concept is, well, you know, to win the world, we have to be just like the world. And so, believe it or not, there are preachers that, that, sit, that stand behind pulpits and actually will to show how in they are with the crowd and how modern they are and how good they are at connecting with the newest generation. There are preachers that will just, in the first couple of minutes of their message, drop the F-bomb. Boom! I want to show you I'm real. I'm real, so I'm using this language. And then they walk out from behind the stage and they're not wearing, hopefully you consider me modestly dressed. I, I hope so. I'm, I try to be. They walk out and they've got these skinny, tight jeans, torn, ripped, maybe a shirt that's not even tucked in all the way so that if they do this, oh, they're look. Oh, I saw his belly button. Oh, and, and because they want, they think they need to be like the world in order to win the world. Uh, this is why this documentary this past week that dropped on Hillsong and what was going on up in New York City at, at Hillsong, New York, and the pastor, I was shocked at some of the video and some of the, the, the photos that I was seeing of how this man was dressing. And I'm like, are you kidding me? It was just, it was appalling for any Christian, forget even just a minister of the gospel. And, and so Paul is saying, did you learn Christ that way? Is that really what Christ taught us? to dress sensuously, to, to, to have the party spirit, to, 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 to love money so much that it just consumes us. Is that really what Christ teaches us? And the answer is no, but yet Paul has to ask the question. 
And, and, and here's why the question is asked. Because un unless we come to Christ at a very young age, we're coming in and we're carrying baggage with us. We're carrying that Gentile baggage, the old way of life with us. And sometimes that stuff has a way of hanging on. Can I get an amen on this? Sometimes this stuff has a way of hanging on. So, so Paul wants to make it very clear that this is not the school of Christ. It doesn't work that way in the school of Christ. There are things that have to be dropped. There's some people that, that have a real aversion. Now, I'm going to use a, a bad word. I'm sorry. You're not going to like this. This is a, a, the equivalent to a four-letter word for many Christians. You ready? Get ready to... The word is repent. I, I'm actually really not kidding. There are some Christians that believe that a, a follower of Christ should never even have to use the word. It has nothing to do with them. Uh, it it's, it's, should be an outlawed word because we need to be people of faith or just people of encouragement and don't worry about repentance. But they're missing something in the school of Christ. When we have that excess baggage from our Gentile way of life, whether it be literally things that we own or, or people that we're around or whether it just be habits, and that's really you know, our attitude. When we come to Christ, in order for some of those things to go, and we'll learn this next week, and, and so I'm not preaching out of school here, so to speak. I'm preaching in school. We'll learn in the, in the following verses in verse 22 that there are things that we have to put off. That's repentance. And see, if you don't put certain things off, you're not going to get the new things of Christ on. That's why repentance is necessary. That, that's why the concept of separation, that's very real, not just in the Old Testament. Separation is not just an Old Testament doctrine. It's a New Testament doctrine. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, chapter 6. Read about the fact that, that the Lord says very clearly that we can, that we, I'm, again, I'm paraphrasing, we can't have fellowship with darkness. What fellowship has light with darkness? We can't have any of that. We set, we, and so these are the things that we put off. These are the old habits that, well, this is how I was taught to do it. How about that, right? How many of you have gone into a job and maybe you were doing something similar, but now you've taken a, a, another job and maybe it's a little more up there? And you go into that job and you start doing the job and then the, the owner or the manager comes and says, whoa, 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 that's not the way to do it. But that's the way I've always done it. Well, no, we do it a different way. See, that's what Jesus is saying to us. We still want to win and come into church. I'm saved, but now I'm just going to live my life like I've always lived it. Maybe, oh, I, you know what I can do? I, I can do all the same stuff, but if I put a cross or a dove on my lapel, that'll make it okay. Maybe I, I'll paint a little cross on my TV screen and then whatever comes in, it's sanctified because there's a cross on it. No, really. And, but, but the Lord comes in, the teacher of the... And he says, this is not how we do things. This is not how we now live our lives. Those things now have to go. There, listen to me, folks. There can be no abiding salvation without repentance. It, it's not going to happen. And, then, and so then the separation, though, is that not enough. We will learn next week again that we put off, but then that we also put on. So we have to put some things off and we have to put some things on. And the Holy Spirit works through us in, com in combination with the word. But the key here is we have not learned Christ in this way. It is to say that the church should look like the world and act like the world and talk like the world is absolutely, that's nonsense. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. That's absolute, complete, total nonsense. So I ask you again, are you still in school? Are you still in school today? Are you willing to learn today? Are you willing to grow today? Are you willing to be pushed today to learn something maybe new or something that's been forgotten that will help you to move over the next hill as you continue on in your journey with Christ? To move up a level. No longer in elementary school. Going to at least move to junior high. Maybe you move from junior high to high school, maybe even to college, but the point is we constantly growing and learning in him. Are you still in school? That's only a question that you can ask yourself. And then verse 21, if indeed you have heard him. So he says, you haven't learned Christ this way, if indeed you have heard him. So first there's an if right there. We got to take just a moment with that. The word if, I-F, is a big word in the Bible. 
You say, it's only two letters. Oh, it's a huge word. It's a massive word. It appears from Genesis to Revelation. It always denotes that someone must make a choice. If this, then that, oftentimes, is the concept when it comes to God and man. If you'll do this, God says, I will do that, and I will always carry out my end of the bargain. And so, if, he says, Paul says, if indeed you have heard him. So salvation, sanctification is always conditional. God never twists our arm. God, God is not going to bang us on the head and put us in chains and put us in the schoolroom setting. Set us in class. Some of you maybe have had to have been chained down, but the Lord doesn't chain people down. He leaves it up to us. We can either stay in school with him or we can go out and learn the ways of the world again. Every Christian has that opportunity. How many have known someone that they started well, but then at some point in the journey, they left the schoolroom and they back out in the world? Anybody else have that happen? Come on, almost all of us could raise our hands. We know that that happens. So he says, if you have heard him, and he says then, if you have been taught by him. So there's two notes here, all right? The first one is if you have heard Christ. Notice he does not say if you have heard about Christ. Now, some of the translations may put about him in there, but it actually, really, he is saying, if you have heard Christ. Matthew 17, 15, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. This is when Jesus went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And, and behold, a voice came out of the cloud and said, this is the Father, God the Father speaking to Peter and the others, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. What's the rest of it? Listen to him. If you have heard him and God the Father says, this is my son, I'm pleased with him. Listen to him. In John 10, 27, Jesus says it this way. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So Paul says, if indeed you have heard him. Folks, how many people in the churches today are really hearing Jesus? How many Christians, so-called, are really listening to and hearing Christ? And I'm not talking about an audible voice. I'm not, I'm not talking about something like that. I'm just saying you're tuned in, and through God's Word and by the Spirit, you're hearing the voice of Christ. We need to hear that voice again. We need to hear Him. We need to listen to Him. And then he says the second thing is, if you've heard Him and if you've been taught by Him, him. Again, taught in or by or through him. And here we have not only the teaching of Christ, but now we also have, have we been taught by, the, by those that are in leadership positions in the church that, that are commanded to bring the message of Christ to the believers. This is why you cannot stay outside of the church realm, the gathering realm, whatever you want to call it, and be a lone ranger and grow in Christ. It cannot be done. Remember we already read earlier that God, when, when Christ ascended back to heaven, he gave what? He gave apostles, prophets, past, uh, um, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. For the edifying, for the growing up, the building up of the body of Christ. So he says, have you been taught by him? And again, have you been schooled in Jesus Christ? And if a person's found Christ, then this should be demonstrated through a changed lifestyle. That's what Paul is saying here. He's saying if you're going to talk the talk that you're really a believer, then you need to walk the walk. And this is why he's giving the instruction here. So important. See, Christian belief includes Christian ethics, Christian morals. In other words, a lifestyle that demonstrates it. And, and it's all summed up in him. I'm living, I'm walking, I'm being taught, I'm learning of him and in him, in Jesus. Amen. So this is not Jesus standing far away. This is like Jesus, you know, we talk about hands on in school and learning. things. Jesus is right here with us. If we will allow him to fill us and to empower us and to be with us, to help us hands on experience. Amen. Via the spirit of God. And so it's a critical question. A lot of churches don't emphasize teaching anymore. They either just emphasize evangelism. And by the way, 
I understand there are always, you know, there, there's always mixed multitudes within the church, meaning some people are genuinely saved and oftentimes there are people that are not. But some churches, the sole emphasis is we're just going to preach to the lost. Even if everyone in the church, there's no visitor that day, but we're just going to keep preaching to the lost. Service in, service out. That sounds neat, but that's not really the Bible definition of church when we come together as believers. If an unbeliever comes in, great. We trust the Spirit of God works and moves upon their heart and that they get convicted. But really what happens is when we come in together, we grow together, we are taught and learn of Christ, and then we can carry that message out individually to the lost and the dying world all around us. Can I get an amen on that? So, so this is the way this works. So have we learned of him? And it's a critical question because a lot of churches are no longer teaching. They've abandoned it. We're not going to abandon good, solid Bible teaching. It will serve us well as we move forward in these last days. Acts 2.42, it's amazing. It says this. This is the infant church, the early church, right after the day of Pentecost. They were continually devoting themselves. This is the people that are being saved. To the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Very first thing mentioned in the early church is that they were devoting themselves to teaching, to learning, to growing. I like the way that Kent Hughes says it. When true preaching takes place, Jesus is invisibly in the pulpit and walking the aisles, personally teaching his own, his people, through the word as the word is brought forth by the spirit. And I love that. So I ask you again, are you still in school? Are you still in the school of Christ? Are you still, do you still want to grow? Do you still willing to learn and grow in him? I, my hands are up. Yes, I am, Lord. I want to keep growing in you. All right, and then he makes this final statement in verse 21. If indeed you've heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Notice here that Paul is not suggesting that some truth is found in Jesus and that other truth can be found out there apart from Jesus. He instead, Paul's point, is that the gospel contains and sums up all of that which we would call truth. All legitimate truth, not facts. There are facts that are out there. Two plus two equals four. That's a fact. Doesn't make it divine truth. I mean, it is true. Two plus two equals four. But you get my, my meaning. There's some people that confuse those things. There's some people that want to blend all of this. Well, all truth is God's truth. And what they mean by that is anything that even the world would suggest to us and say, well, this kind of works, this is good, the way it goes, then that's incorporated into the church and into God's truth. That's not the way it works. Here, what Paul is saying is that truth is found in Jesus Christ. He says it again, as the truth is in Jesus. So what's truth? I learned a great definition of truth almost 40 years ago when I bought my first, uh, one of my first study Bibles. Great, great little study Bible called the, the Open Bible. And in this version of the Open Bible, as, as I'm a young Christian and I'm reading through and studying, I'm in the glossary section um, and, and it's giving certain key words in the Bible. And I come to this word truth. And I've never seen it defined like this anywhere else. So if you want to write it down, if you're taking notes, this is really, this has stuck with me all these years. So truth is that which agrees with final reality. All right. I'm, all right. I'm explaining it to you now. I want you, to, you we're, we're in the school. Think about this. Truth, as God defines it, is that which agrees with Final reality. All right, what is final reality? Final reality is God. It is not the universe even now as we see it, because God said there will be a new heavens and a new earth. Final reality is not what you and I experience necessarily in the here and now, because we're experiencing one another with bodies that are dying, with bodies that are getting old, with bodies that, you know, all. So these things are not final reality. But truth is that which agrees with final reality. Heaven, 
hell, God, his kingdom, his purposes, not the things that we see all around us that change constantly. That's not truth. Bible truth is that which agrees with final reality. Okay, I can see that that really excited you. It excited me. I, I thought it would excite one or two of you. I, I thought it was wonderful when I read it years ago. It still excites me. Because it differentiates Bible truth from things that come and go, fads, different things that happen, things that we take as reality that God says, man, those things aren't real at all. You think that's real? That's not even real at all. That's passing away, just like the world is passing away. And so, truth. Jesus is truth. In fact, he said it in John 8, 32. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. Set you free. No, Muhammad Ali was not the one to come up with that. Or whoever, the boxer, whoever. I'm the truth. Yeah, well, no. Jesus is the truth. John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You see, the life of Jesus Christ, the teachings of Jesus Christ. Think about the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and 6 and so on. The, the, the cross of Jesus Christ. All these things forever exclude the union of faith and immorality. If you know Jesus and you know who Jesus is and that he is the truth, then there can be no doubt whatsoever that faith and immorality will forever be at opposite ends of the spectrum. The two can never be blended together as some would attempt to do even within the church. No. When you know who Jesus is and you know his teachings and you know his life, you know his death, burial, and resurrection, you realize those two are completely incompatible. And the New Testament is filled with exhortations to make sure that those two things continue to stay incompatible, that the church never, we may as individuals, someone may slip or fall, we come right back to Jesus. That's what we have to do, repent and come right back to Jesus. But as a church, we can never, ever say, we will allow immorality, or the ways of the world in, they are not compatible with faith. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. They are not compatible. Brother Ivor, if you would come talk about truth in Jesus Christ, I think of this great description of Jesus in Revelation 19 when he's about to come from heaven back to this earth for the battle of Armageddon, and we read this in verse 11. John says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. Folk, can I just tell you that the Christian life is the only life worth living because it is the only true life. It's the only thing that lasts and is really true. Everything else is a shadow. People grasp at things that they think will bring satisfaction and they realize they're grasping at shadows, things that are changing constantly. Jesus Christ is the only abiding truth. And in a world where truth is constantly sacrificed at the altar of relativity, well, all truth is relative, uh, or relative morality, you know, well, that was true then, that was accepted then, but now we have a new morality. Where that's going on all around us, I gain comfort from the fact that Jesus is the truth. And that that truth remains it does not change the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I adhere to Jesus Christ, both beginning with him and ending with him by his grace and his mercy. And so the Ephesians, Paul says, if you have found this truth in Jesus, then now live it. And it's the same for us. If you say you found this truth in Jesus, now it's time to live it. And for us, it begins by answering the question, are you still in the school of Christ? Yes. Are you still in school? I raise my hand and say, Lord, I'm still in school and I want to stay in school. I'm not, I'm not quitting. I'm not playing hooky. I'm not going to quit for a few years and then think I can return later on. No, 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 because I might never return. I'm just staying right in my seat and I'm going to let Jesus keep telling me what he needs to tell me through his word. At Jesus, take me up to the blackboard, and if I get it wrong, Jesus would be right there. No, Gary, this is how it goes. Lord, I'm staying in school with you. Amen? I'm learning of Christ. I hope that you are constantly learning and growing in him. With that said, I'm going to ask you to bow your head and let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, such an important word today. 
As believers, we must be reminded that we sometimes carry baggage from the world, Lord. Sometimes we've learned things in our mind, our disposition, our actions, our habits that are not compatible with you and with your kingdom. In fact, we've come out of the world. They're not compatible. You give us a whole new playbook to go through. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that we would forever learn of you and that we would grow in you and that we realize it's not just learning about you, it is learning in you. You are teaching us. You are helping us to grow by your spirit and through your word. Remind us of these truths. I pray everyone here that we would stay in school, Lord, that we would stay in the school of Christ. Sometimes it may be hard. Sometimes we may have to learn lessons and maybe the Lord says, now you didn't do well on this test, but we're going to go through it again. And Lord, if that's the case, then help us to be humble, to receive the marks that you've given to us, but then to accept your help to grow and to, to get better in those grades and to do better, Lord, not for earning salvation, but for just growing in you and staying with you. That's what we want to do because we love you because you first loved us. So minister to this truth to your people and we'll thank you and we'll praise you. In Jesus' name, we ask it all. Amen, amen. and amen.